السلام عليكم ورحمة الله. إن شاء الله. It's a very beautiful sight. May Allah سبحانه وتعالى reward you all and bless you all. إن شاء الله. I would like to start with the hadith of الله عليه وسلم and I love this hadith. Especially because there's a lot of people here that I've never seen before. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he says in the authentic hadith, he says none of you will enter paradise until you believe. Then he said, and none of you will truly believe until you love for your brother what you love for yourself. And then he says, صلى الله عليه وسلم, speaking to the Sahaba, he says to them, shall I tell you something that if you were to do it, it will increase the love amongst you? They said, yes, O Prophet of Allah, tell us. He, صلى الله عليه وسلم, he says, he says, give salam to one another. So inshallah ta'ala, there's a lot of brothers here you probably have never seen before. If I can kindly ask everyone to stand up, inshallah, and give salam to someone that they don't know, inshallah. Yalla, to fulfill the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Give salam to someone you don't know. Introduce yourself. The sisters can also do the same. Bismillah wa alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. All praise is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we send peace and blessings upon his beloved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So my brothers and sisters, I'm sure most of you are aware of the crimes that took place last Saturday night or last Saturday and night in which two Muslim brothers were killed, shot dead, one of them was 21 years of age. He was shot in his car and then burnt. And the other brother was not sure what his age was, but he was shot. He was a, he was a husband and a father to be. And his friend was also shot with him. I'm not sure of the condition of his friend, but he died. And unfortunately, these incidents are somewhat becoming common. These are becoming common. And I've thought deeply about how I want to word tonight because my brothers, there's nothing honorable about Jahiliyyah in any way, shape or form. You have to understand as Muslims, we are to love what Allah loves and to hate what Allah hates. Allah hates jahl, my brothers. Allah hates arrogance. Allah hates kibr. And Allah hates crime. Allah hates corruption. And Allah Azza wa Jal hates murder. There's been lots of murders. Lots. We've lost count. And some, some people will feel, brother, wallah, that person, he's better off being in the ground. It's better for the community. You don't know what this guy did. And, and probably to some extent, there's some truth to that. And some people were probably genuinely innocent and didn't deserve to die. Whatever the case is, understand that Allah Azza wa Jal will deal with every single person. There's this ignorance, there's this foolishness amongst, and this is the thing, my brothers, especially the young ones, I want you to understand, shaitan will stop at nothing. And shaitan's ultimate goal is to take you to where? Where, where? Kufr. Straight kufr. Shaitan wants you to make kufr, then making your final abode, Jahannam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. So shaitan, because shaitan's been around for a long time, shaitan decorates evilness with some sort of prestige. You see? So he surrounds jihl, like this, this, this foolishness, this, this corruption, this so-called, wallahi, I'm trying to avoid words that even trigger some sort of prestige in our minds. You know, even the word gangster, I can't stand it because for some people it has a, it has some sort of like a positive, you know, that wallah, he's a, you know, that, you know, he's a gangster. And if I could use words, but because I'm in the masjid, I have to respect this place. But Allah knows what, would have, what sort of words I would have used. You know, even this word gangster is filth, it's rubbish, it's trash. 
So shaitan starts this jahil life with some sort of prestige, you know. And this isn't new. Started off in the 60s, started off before that with mafias and things like this, where it's always, you know, there was some sort of code, some sort of code and conduct that, that you know, that these people of jahiliyyah somewhat lived by. But it was all jahil. And it all leads to eventually kufr. So they first start off by not, you know, um, not dealing with drugs, you know, ripping off from, from the rich, giving to the poor, this sort of Robin Hood style. Um, and then it goes from that and then, then it went to, you know, crimes, but we only attack the people that we assume actually deserve it. And then from there, it started to be drugs. But when they started with drugs, you don't sell to your own kind. And then from drugs, it went to prostitution, but obviously we don't prostitute our own women. This is the nonsense. This is the trash and the rubbish that shaitan and the, and the army of shaitan, this is the stuff that they introduced. And then obviously Hollywood amplified it and things of this nature. But shaitan walks you through. So there are things that you now as a good boy, as a good man, you start off, you say, you know what? If I ever did that, brother, well, I wouldn't do this and I wouldn't do that. That's now. But shaitan will make you walk through things until eventually you get to a point where there is no return. And wallah, I used to hear it growing up. Brother, you don't attack a man if he's with his family. You don't punch a man in the face if he wears glasses. Do you guys remember that one? The young boys don't even remember that. If someone wears glasses, back in the, like I remember when I was a kid, you can't punch him. Because that was considered the ab. You know, like, like that's a bad go. The guy wears glasses, you know. And then it was this sick, and, and, and well, like, this is the sickness of this life. That, you know what, brother, look, as long as, you know, it's, it's, it's Muslim against non-Muslim crime. Almost like as if that that's somewhat justified, huh? Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he wasn't sent down as a mercy to all of humanity. But this is how shaitan works. And then he became Muslim on Muslim crime. And then it was like, you know, you know, like even brothers told me now, Wallah, brother, you know, do you remember the days when you used to pick a park and we used to punch on with our problems? Yeah, brother, that was just as terrible. Like, we've sunk so low that we actually think back to a lesser harmful time and think that that was better. And this is shaitan. This is shaitan. Until eventually now, Muslims kill Muslims. And there is no limit anymore. They've shot people in front of their kids, in front of their wives, in front of a masjid. In the month of Ramadan, walked into someone's house and shot him while he was in the bed. And everyone feels like, you know, to some degree it's justifiable. Wallah, my brothers, Allah will hold accountable every single person. And what's even more sickening is some people think that through the deen that they can justify it. That while I look, brother, you know, that in Islam, there's a life for a life. That if someone kills my brother, this has now become, this is extremely dangerous. That look, brother, if someone kills my brother, that therefore I can take matters into my own hands and then therefore I can find out who killed, this, who killed my brother and I can take his life and actually believe that I'm free with Allah. And what's worse is they use deen to justify it. Never in the history of Islam and nowhere in the Sharia does the deen of Allah allow any citizen to take matters into his own hands, ever. This sick and twisted understanding of Sharia and the deen of Allah. This jahiliya that's in our minds now. That because you took the life of my brother, therefore, because Allah says in the Quran, a tooth for a tooth and an eye for an eye and a life for a life. How dare you? How dare you make tafsir of Quran according to your own whims and your own desires and your own jail and try to justify one of the worst sins you could possibly commit? Yes, do we have a tooth for a tooth and an eye for an eye? Yes. But who judges that, my brothers? In Islam, in an Islamic state, in a Sharia, you take your situation to a judge. 
the person is tried and then if found guilty in a court where he's allowed, a trial is allowed, he's allowed to explain himself, evidence is, you know, evidence is displayed. And then if the judge finds the man guilty of murder, then the judge hands to the family the options. Would you prefer blood money? Do you prefer a life for a life? Or the ultimate, of course, is do you choose to forgive? But if you choose a life for a life, you don't take his life. The judge executes this. So now Muslims feel like, you know, Wallah, brother, I can take matters into my own hand because, Wallah, I heard a hadith. This is recklessness. This is recklessness. And by Allah, my brothers, there's coming a day, a day that is 50,000 years long. A day that is 50,000 years long. One day with Allah is equivalent to 1,000 years of our time. And on this day, my brothers, every single person will be held accountable for everything they uttered, for everything they looked at, for every action that they did. And if you think you're going to be okay, prophets and messengers were terif are terrified of this day. The Prophet ﷺ was walking with a companion and in front of them was two animals and they were fighting. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says to the Sahabi, he says to him, uh, he says to him, do you know what they're fighting about? Animals. So the companion says to him, no, Prophet of Allah, I don't know, the animals. He says to him, by Allah, Allah knows what they're fighting about. And on the day of judgment, Allah will bring justice between them. Animals. He's telling him, Allah knows why they're fighting and on the day of judgment, Allah will bring justice between them. That if a horned animal harmed an animal that didn't have horns, on the day of judgment, Allah Azza wa is going to remove the horns from the horned animal, place them on the animal that didn't have horns and then Allah will allow that animal to take its rights back. And such is that day. And brothers feel like, well, you know, we can walk around the streets and we can run amok. And worse, justify their filth, justify their crimes through deen. Brothers that are selling drugs on the streets. And then they come to me, oh, well, brother, he ripped me off and I want my heart. He wants his heart. He wants his rights. He's selling drugs. Him. He's selling drugs. And he was ripped off. And now he wants to pursue the money that he was ripped off and genuinely believes that he can kill him. Because deen is about haq and batil. This is a mockery of deen. This is a mockery of deen. And the person that takes the life of someone, my brothers, wallah, no talk will ever do justice. Do you know what it means to take the life of someone? To have someone's blood on your hands. When the Prophet wasallam he spoke about two Muslims killing each other. He was speaking about a specific scenario and he said, the murderer and the murdered are both going to Jahannam. So the Sahaba were amazed. They said, a prophet of Allah, the murderer, we understand. But the murdered, he said, the murdered had an equal intention to kill the murderer. It's just that the murderer got to him before the other one did. They're both going to Jahannam. To take the life of someone is a direct challenge to Allah. Allah. 
direct challenge with Allah Azza wa Jal. Anyway, I didn't want to make this my topic to be honest with you. This community is fed up and I'm sure all of you here would agree. This community is fed up. Wallah, I'm sick and tired of attending these. I love attending funerals, normal funerals. So much ajr in it. But I'm sick and tired. Wallah, so many times I've taken an oath that I would never ever go to another funeral where someone is killed or murdered over nonsense like this. But always one reason or another, my arm is twisted and I end up going. You go to a funeral and you see a group of people. And then when there's a retaliation made, I go to the other guy's funeral and I see half of the same people that were there at the other funeral. How embarrassing is this? Wallahi, you go to a funeral now and just the heads, the attitude, that kibr, the, the display of arrogance. You know what's worse than murder? Skibber. There are some bad crimes and bad scenes that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he spoke about deeply, intensively. Like for instance, like think of zina, right? Think of zina, think of murder, think of theft. But if, like you never find that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam like gives a threshold to it, you know? Like you never hear or uh, anyone that commits, you know, like anyone that kills five or six people, that his punishment, no, 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 khalas, murder, we understand. Zina, adultery, we understand. But when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam spoke about kibr and he spoke about arrogance, you know what he says? And you see it, you see it in people's walk, in people's talk, in people's clothing, in the way we just, I see it, man. This, the Prophet says, anyone with an atom's weight of kibr, how much? What's the threshold? What's the threshold? He didn't say anyone that kills two people, three people, ten people. He didn't say anyone that commits adultery once or twice or three. No, 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 no. Anyone with an atom's weight of kibr. What's an atom? Can't see it with the human eye. Cannot see it with the human eye. He says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, anyone with an atom's weight of pride. He says, never mind seeing paradise. He'll never smell its fragrance. Allah mentions Ibadur Rahman. They are the ones who when they walk on the earth, they walk humbly. They walk what? Humbly. Anyway, we're all fed up. And brothers always come and talk to me, brother, wallah, this has to stop, this has to stop, this has to stop. And there's multiple problems in the community. If it's not murder, it's zina. If it's not zina, it's husbands and wives cheating. If it's not husbands and wives cheating. Brother, there's the flaws and mistakes and they're everywhere. What's the solution? What's the solution, my brothers? What's the solution, my sisters? Because everyone's waiting for the next man to do something about it. And you may be a very good person here now and you're thinking, brother, murderers, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know anyone that's ever murdered someone and you know, it's just these bad boys that are... I used to think like this too, huh? I've been through all of the emotions. I've been through it all. I've been through, you know what, brother, let them all kill each other and let them all clean each other up, you know? I've been through that phase. The reality is anything and everything that they do harms us directly. We all suffer. No one wins in this. And as a community, whether we like it or not, we have to care. Because if we don't unite, and if we don't come together, and if we don't stand united against these things, things are only going to get only. But what's the solution? Because let me confess from the onset now, let me confess from the onset, that yes, I genuinely believe that the Mashaykh are not doing enough. And I believe that the Da'is like myself are not doing enough. 
And I believe that our masajid and our Islamic institutions are not doing enough. I'm prepared to say this. If you're prepared to tell me that you also are not doing enough. We've come to a point where we have freed ourselves from responsibilities. That these bad things that are happening out there, that this is for, that this is for the mashaykh to fix. This is for the organizations to fix. And the reality is that the dramas and the situation that's happening outside is far greater than any one sheikh, far greater than any one masjid, far greater than any day. It's going to take a whole community to fix the problems that we have. As Muslims, we don't have the luxury to see wrong and then say, well, it's got nothing to do with me, man. Let someone else go clean it up. We don't have that right. We don't have that privilege. What's happening outside on the streets and the future of our children, my brothers, is the responsibility upon every shoulder that's sitting in this masjid. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam says, he who's not concerned with the affairs of the Muslims is what? He says he's not from us. He who's not concerned with the affairs of the Muslims, he's not from? Every single one of us is responsible and every single one of us has a job and by Allah, like the murderer, Allah is going to question him. Every single one of us is going to be questioned on the day of judgment. You've seen what was happening. What did you do about it? Allah says in the Quran, Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat nas." What an amazing verse. Allah Jalla Jalalu says in the Quran, that you, O Muslims, this ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, Kuntum, you are the greatest nation that was ever sent out to humanity. Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat nas. Why? Because your name is Ahmed? Your name is Mustafa? Why? Because you got a Louis Vuitton cap? What made us so unique and special? What made us special, my brothers? My sisters, what has made us special? We've forgotten. Wallahi, we've forgotten. We think that we've been created so that, Wallah, brother, I can live. I'll pray and fast and do what I have to do, but then try and make this dunya my jannah. And deep down, whether you know it or you're not, that's what, that's what the aim is. We're all trying to live the American dream. Have a nice house that's paid off. Huh? And this isn't haram, just so you know, well, I'm not saying this is haram. But deep down, this is my drive, this is my ambition, this is what I want. Heck, have a nice hectic double story house paid off. And if it can be a duplex site, then mad when my son gets married, inshallah, I'll make a duplex and, and put a granny flat in the back of that one and a granny flat in the back of that one. You know, while I hectic, bro. Have a nice hectic, like a nice hectic family car for the wife. And then a nice weekend toy for me. You know what I mean? No, you know what I mean? But brother, wallah, idi al Quran, ay, it's all in the halal, ay. And this is, you know, again, well, and these things are not haram. Who wouldn't love to own a house? And who wouldn't love to have a toy? And who? But, but, but Allah didn't create us for this. When Allah says, Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat nas, Allah is telling you that you are the greatest nation that was sent out. Why, my brothers? Why? Because you send your son to Quran school? Why, sister? Why? Because you wear hijab? What did Allah say? You enjoin that which is good. You forbid that which is evil. You enjoin that which is good. You forbid that which is evil. And you believe in Allah. And it was this that made us the greatest nation on earth. Today we see the wrong. We see the halat. We, wallah, we're all united. My frustration is all of your frustrations. And every time I see, brother, have you seen what's happening on the streets? Have you seen, wallah, bro, things are only getting worse. But, and then it's like, okay, we've become masters at highlighting the problem. Masters. Masters at highlighting the problem. But who fixes it? 
Oh, brother, I don't know. Allah, I don't know. You fix it, brother. You just make another video, Hablus. And let me just keep playing cards and smoking, ar- you know, and smoking argili and playing arbaami with the boys in the gang. Because, wallah, brother, you know, I'm not, I'm not, you know. This isn't going to pass on the day of judgment. Umar bin al-Khattab says, whoever wants to fulfill, you know, whoever wants to, whoever wants to be from the greatest ummah, he needs to fulfill the conditions of the verse. Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrajat linnas. Why? Because we enjoin that which is good and we forbid that which is evil. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he says, when any one of you sees a munkar, when any one of you sees a wrong, sees haram, he sees corruption, he has to stop this with his hands. And then he says, and if you can't stop it with your hands, you know, sometimes the situation doesn't allow you to fix it with your hands. What does he say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? then he should fix it with his tongue. Speak out. Call it for what it is. Advice. I love all of this. The hands and the tongue in the best way with wisdom and hikmah and love and rahmah in the heart. But you need to stop it with your hands. And if I can't stop it with my hands, then with my tongue. And then the Prophet says, and if you can't fix it with your tongue, then you should at least hate it in your heart. And this is the weakest iman. Today we see haram and we laugh and giggle. Brothers, we sit down and we remember our jahiliyyah and we try to outdo each other who had more haram. Allah subhanahu wa Wallahi my brothers, we don't have this luxury. We don't have this luxury. You can tell me, Wallah, brother, you know, I'm a simple man and Wallah. And this is another sickness that's within us. Wallah, brother, you know what? I'm going to look after myself. I'm going to look after my wife. I'm going to look after my kids, brother. Wallah, brother, you know, this is. And he thinks, you know, he thinks in his own mind that, that, that this sort of language has credit. Brother, if anyone was going to think like that, then surely the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who would have received his wahi, he would have sat in his house, waited for death, and he would have went to al-maqam al-mahmud, and then the rest of humanity went to the, would have went to the depths of Jahannam. If he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was to have such sick mentality. You were created to worship Allah. And a part of worshipping Allah is to call that to which is good and to forbid that which is evil. The only reason why our area is the way it is and the only reason why it will continue to get worse and worse is because we've abandoned our job of giving da'wah. Nothing else. Stop waiting for some super sheikh to come from some super country with some super amama that's going to give you some super hadith that you've never heard. This is Disneyland. This is Disneyland. Not going to happen. Because the Prophet ﷺ had to work hard. The Sahaba had to work hard. And any person that wants change has to work hard. The Ummah is full of great ideas. Ooh, this Ummah, brother. Ideas? Shut the gates. Shut the gates. I remember once we're doing, we went to Hajj, Umrah, I can't remember, and we're doing Tawaf. So one of the brothers gets me, brother, what's this Tawaf, man? Everyone in Alam Faitina Ba'ad, and there's no aura, and it's just all over the place. So I'm thinking, Wallah, brother, I don't know, man, just make your Tawaf, and let's just, you know. Nah, 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 brother, this, this, is, this isn't right, you know. Three days, three days, then he comes by, he gets me, you know what, brother, I've been thinking about it. Yeah, he gets me, brother, wallah, I have a solution. I said, yeah. He said, me, brother, this, you know, people stepping on your feet and spitting on the floor and bumping into you. Ali, brother, this has got to stop. Tell him, all right, so what's your solution? And he look, brother, I've come up with a system. It's like a snail system. Tell him, yeah, he gets me, so you start out. He gets me, start on the outer. And with every lap, you get closer and closer and closer and closer to the Kaaba until you finish your seven. You kiss the black stone and then you go, and then we have an underground exit and then you get out. <laughs> Allahu Akbar, what an amazing idea, bro. Cracker. Cracker. 
This ummah is not short of amazing ideas. But when it comes to actioning, Shaykh, you do it, inshallah, brother. Brother, you do it, inshallah. Brother, how much money do you want? Allah doesn't want your money, my brothers. Allah doesn't want your money. What does Allah want? Allah wants your time. Allah wants your action. You're looking at the kids now and, and oh, well, brother, this is, brother, things are only going to get worse. If we don't start caring for one another, brother, just caring for other kids, caring for other kids. It's become non-existent. Why? Because, brother, you know, what can I do? You know, I'll tell you this story that will, I think it will explain what I'm trying to say. I was cutting my hair once. And there was a group of kids outside. And they had just finished school and they were being very loud. And Wallahi, like, they were mainly Lebos, because I'm Lebanese. And I could tell that they're Muslims. And so the barber whispers in my ear. He asked me, look, bro, can you see that, man? And Wallah, it was like he put a dagger in my heart, you know. Because, brother, they're my people, man. These are my brothers. He asked me, brother, I run the biggest mark. They're very loud. They're very rowdy whenever women... And yet, and, and, and bro, everything he's saying is true. Like, it's frustrating. And I understand, you know. And I myself would be annoyed. But this, but this idea of, you know, it's like he's telling me. Like, it's almost like he's convincing himself that, look, I've done my job by telling him. And most of us do this. So I said to him, brother, what are you doing about it? He asked me, brother, what can I do, man? I'm just a barber. And most of us are exactly the same. Well, brother, what can I do, man? I don't know how to talk. I don't know how to do what you do. Almost as if like da'wah is only sitting in front of a table and yelling at people. This is the only form of da'wah. This foolishness. So I said to him, brother, what are you doing about it? He asked me, well, brother, you know, I'm just a barber. What can I do? I said to him, brother, do you, do you know any of these boys? He said to me, yeah, more than half of them are my customers. I said to him, brother, on average, how long does it take you to cut someone's hair? He said to me, oh, between half hour to 40 minutes. I said, so for, so for half hour or 40 minutes, that kid is sitting on your chair, giving you his undivided attention because he can't even be on his phone because you've got that shroud over him, whatever it is. He asked me, yeah. I said, so you have him for 45 minutes sitting on this chair. I said to me, I said to him, brother, what are you talking to him about? You have something his own mother doesn't get from him. Which mother gets 40 minutes of her un undivided attention of her son just direct? Which, which mother gets this? Which sheikh gets this? 40 minutes, this kid is sitting at the mercy of your scissors. What are you saying to him? So he goes red in the face. I said, brother, I know you mean well. But it's not good enough to simply say, look at that, man. He's sitting here for 40 minutes. What are you saying to him? A good word from you, and a good word from his uncle, and a good word from his neighbor, and a good word from the sheikh at the masjid, and a good word from his teacher. It takes a whole community to raise a young boy. But if the barber doesn't care, and the butcher doesn't care, and the neighbor doesn't care, guess what? No one cares. Of course he's lost, he's broken. I had this other genius, Allah Ya Rab, and wallahi credit to the neighbor, uh, sorry, credit to the, to the Baba, he said, you know what brother, I'm gonna start doing this inshallah. I said to him, yeah bro, inshallah ta'ala. I had, this, I had this other guy, he asked me, bro, wallah my neighbor man, Allah Yahdi, you know, his father is not there, this, that and the other. I said to him, yeah, he asked me, man, his son, he's 13 years old, he's already smoking pot. The kid is how old? 13. And he's already smoking weed. So what's he going to be doing when he's 21? Only Allah knows. Only Allah knows. And he was really annoyed, you know, that look. So I said to him, brother, what are you doing about it? <laughs> it's not my kid, I'm khalaf unesi, brother. It's not my kid. And wallah, we don't realize, this is our attitude. 
but we're all annoyed when there's another shooting. But we're all annoyed when our women are half naked walking on the streets. I said, brother, what are you doing about it? He said, no, Allah, brother, you know, what do you want me to do about it? I said, brother, anta manna kam khalla mahal in, brother, you've left no destination in Sydney except you fished its mum. Fishing 12, 13, 15 hour fishing trips. Ali, Allah, brother, I love fishing. So, brother, all right, so you love fishing. Take him with you. Take him with you, bro. Take the 12, 13 year old, the guy who his father isn't there. Take him with you. Take him to the fishing place and sit there with him for five hours. Teach him something. Talk to him. Hali wallah, brother, I don't want to give away my fishing spot. <laughs> I don't want to give. That's the truth. Your fishing spot is dearer to you than this kid that's smoking a joint at the age of 13. That's the truth. Tell me you don't want to headbutt this guy. So, so yeah, brother, I don't want to give away my fishing spot. So what are we doing? It's so easy to look at the youngsters and say, well, brother, you know, this generation is lost. Yeah, but brother, what are you doing? What are we doing? I love how people think that, you know what, brother, that, and voila, I, can, I can sit in a garage and play Arbamiye and smoke Argila and sit at this cafe and that cafe and speak about how the Mashaykh aren't doing their job and how the Muslim organization is doing that, but somehow I'm sort of free from it. Doesn't work like this, my brothers. Every single one of us is going to be held responsible. If you really care about your children and you honestly want to protect them, there's no better way than protecting the children of others. And if you really care about your women and you really care about your ard and about your honor, there's no better way to protect them than to protect the ard and the honor of other people. This selfishness of Allah, brother, you know, it's got nothing to do with me. This is selfishness and Allah hates selfish people. So every single one of us is responsible, my brothers. Every one of us. And yes, within your capacity. I understand that people's abilities and techniques are different. I understand. Wallah, I understand. But within your capacity, within your capabilities, Allah is going to hold you responsible. So what happens to us now? Shaitan comes and he overwhelms us with, Wow, oh, Wallah, brother, you know, how do I save the world? Don't save the world. Save the child that's in front of you. Take him in. Take him in. And I'm guilty of this, huh? Wallahi, I am. I'm guilty. I remember at one stage when I had an apprentice, but I was paying him $50 a day. But what's, that's, that's yalla thief, bro. What's, what's 50 bucks a day? Brother, within a few weeks, I felt like I owned him. And what was it about? How can I milk him? And how can I get the maximum out of him for my personal benefit? Wallah, I see this amongst brothers, like brothers that have two, three apprentices or he might have a worker. It's like, you don't want to teach him too much. God forbid, no, no, I don't want to teach him too much. He might become my, you know, he might become my what? Opposition. Look at this, like, brother, what happened to your risk is with Allah. What happened that, you know, if you teach this young boy and you make a man out of him and you teach him that he can get out there and he can earn a dollar, what, do you really think Allah is going to take your rizq away from you? Well, bro, I see it. It's like, you know, you don't want to teach him too much. The kid's an apprentice, he's been working for him for two, three years, he hasn't signed him up yet. He's still paying him cash, hasn't got him on the books. Why? What are you doing to this young? You're breaking him. You're breaking him.
because of your own selfish needs. But then when there's a shooting, nah, brother, this has got to stop, cause wallah, man, this is just pathetic. It doesn't work like this, my brothers. You can't just take, Allah Azza wa Jal doesn't want monks, my brothers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want ubad. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he said, subhanAllah, what did he say? He said, the best of yous are those that learn the Quran and then what? And then they go sit in the corner and read it 24 hours? Who's the best of you? The one that learned Quran and then he went to... Who's the best? He said, the best of you, the best, is the one that learned the Quran. And then what did you do with it? He passed it on. He learned qualities and then he did what? You pass them on. And there are some good kids in this community, man. Wallahi, there is. It's not all doom and gloom. There are some good kids. I've met lots of young boys who you know. Their mother and father have worked very hard on them. Wallah, sometimes I meet boys, I wish my son becomes like that. 12, 13 year old, he comes up to me. Salaamu Alaikum Amma. Gives me a nice firm handshake, eye contact, introduces himself. So you praise that quality. And if his mother and father, there, it's okay. It doesn't take anything away from you, brother. Wallah. Actually, it speaks more about your character when you see good and you praise it. It doesn't take much when you see a father and a mother that's, that have done a good job and you say to them, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you. Because when he succeeds, we succeed. You see a young boy that's dressed well, doesn't look like a thug. Give him salam. You look very handsome. You look good. Praise him. Wallah, it's okay. I like your dress code. Show him that this is what we want. Young sister that carries herself well. The older sisters, praise these qualities. Encourage to nourish these qualities. So Allah, my brothers and sisters, we are going to be held responsible, man. And if you think that we can take a back seat, and if you think, well, brother, you know what, I'm already working hard, and well, you know, this will not work on the Day of Judgment. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what was his dua always? What? Ya Allah, my daughter Fatima. What was his dua, my brothers? What was his ham and his fikr? What was his worry and his concern? What was it? What? His fishing spot? What was it? When did we become so selfish? Wallah, my brother, you don't understand the potential you have. We've limited ourselves for what reason? What good can you do? What good are you contributing towards? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, La in shakartum, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and if you thank me, what will Allah do? What's the what? Allah says, if you thank me, what does Allah do in return? La azidannaka, Allah promises he will give you more. Who knows what the best form of praise is? Who knows? Working. Allah says what? I'malu ala Dawood. Work, O family of Dawood. Work to show thanks to Allah. What's the dearest thing to Allah, my brothers? His deen. Those that work to protect and uplift his deen, they're called the soldiers of Allah. And those that work to simply, you know, these are soldiers of dunya. So we need to choose and choose wisely because I'm telling you things are not getting, things are not getting better, man. 
every single one of us is responsible. So ask yourself, what can you do? Don't go home now and, oh, yeah, that's it, brother, you know what, I'm gonna take on the world. Wallah, step by step, step by step. I was doing scripture. Because it's important to mention good things too, you know. It's like, it's not all do, like I said, it's not all doom and gloom. I was doing scripture in a place, I don't want to mention its name. I was doing, anyway, I was going there on a weekly basis. So one particular week, one particular week, I couldn't make it. So I called up my brother-in-law. Allah, Allah, he's is a gentleman. Yeah, yeah, and this guy's married and he has kids. And he works a corporate job, he has every excuse, every movie that we play. He has them. You know, I said to him, look, I can't make it this particular day. Can you fill in for me? He said to me, yeah, all right, let me see if I can get it. Anyway, he goes there. He asked me, do you mind if I do it for a couple of more weeks? I said, yeah, try it out. Six years later, Six years, he stayed there. Watched kids from year seven, took them all the way to year 12. Normal, young, simple guy. But because this doesn't get attention because there's no wow factor, like how do you put this on Facebook and make it look good? But, but that contribution of his, it's not lost. I know this other woman, Wallahi, I just don't want to mention her name because I haven't asked her. Wallah, 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 three times in the house of Allah. Wallah, she's worth 10,000 men all day long. Uqsum Billah, 10,000 men all day long. Wallahi, she's worth 10 of me anytime you want, brother. Anytime. Woman that's married with kids and has a full-time job and she runs programs in high schools for Muslim boys from her own time doesn't get paid for it makes her own sacrifices runs them for 20 weeks programs and brothers told me well brother what can I do People don't remember the talk. You know what they remember? They remember the guy that smiled at them and walked over and gave him salam and made him feel important. You'll never forget that face in your life. There are young people all around us, but we've just become busy. When was the last time, honestly, just and not everything's necessarily deen, just values. Wallah, you don't even have to be Muslim. Just universal values, principles, code of conduct, things that we all value. When was the last time you, 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 you just gave salam to a child and you taught him how to give salam? Stand up straight, look you in the eye, give you a nice firm handshake, teach that child that there's a lot of communication that comes through your hands and when you look someone, it's just, it's, these are simple things. These are things you do as you see your nephew, as you walk into the masjid, as you're walking out of a, you can do this anywhere. So brothers and sisters, if we want change, then it's upon every single one of us. And by Allah, we will all be held accountable. Because the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, لَتَأْمَرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, you will enjoin that which is good, and you will forbid that which is evil. Because if you don't, Allah will send down a punishment upon you that you will raise your hands and make dua and Allah will not answer it. 
This area is getting worse because we've just become busy. It's almost like we've gotten over Dean. You know, like Dean was special five years ago and now we're just sort of over it. So like, you know, it's, so it's just like a trend that sort of... So whose job is it, my brothers? Whose job? Uh, my job. This is my ummah. This is my ummah. These are my brothers. These are my sisters. It speaks volumes about you as an individual that you see such things taking place. And all you're cared about is, well, brother, you know, where's, where's my next fishing trip? Where's the next holiday? Where's my next pair of shoes that I'm going to buy? And so we need some serious change. Are we ready for this, inshallah? Who's ready to start working for the deen of Allah? Who? However you can. However you can. Maybe you're a brother of Jahiliyyah and you've made some tawbah and Allah has allowed you to make changes in your life. Then talk to these young brothers. Break the glamour, this false glamour that break it in front of them. Before they're broken, men. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you all. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.